Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. And I'm Chris Noble. And we're on a journey to explore the brightest and most innovative minds and initiatives in social purpose. Today, companies and brands must stand for something meaningful. They have to have a social purpose and bring that purpose forward to their employees, their customers, and their community. Each episode, we're talking to leaders at Fortune 100 companies, global brands, social enterprise startups, NGOs, and everything in between. We'll be taking a deep dive to learn how they are integrating purpose into their organizations. To benefit both business and society for enduring impact. Join us. Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn, and with me today is an extraordinary woman, um, Heather Nestle. I I knew about Heather uh, because of being a member of CECP, and I knew a little bit more about New York Life's work. But this past May, Heather was honored with the Charles Moore Award for the top professional in the past year for her work with New York Life and especially their focus on child bereavement. Certainly an urgent social need that need that has powerful alignment with the business of New York Life and the brand. So Heather, welcome to our show. Um, I am honored to have you join and I know our listeners today are going to be so um just, you know, thrilled to learn about the power of focus and your extraordinary work. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Carol. I'm so, so happy to be here. Tell us a little bit about um, your president of the New York Life Foundation. So talk a little bit about what does New York Life do? I know the company was founded in 1845. You may be the oldest company that we will be um, having on our show, but talk about the company, a little bit about its brand, its values and ethos to begin. Sure. So yes, New York Life is 173 years young. This year, we'll be celebrating our 175th anniversary in 2020. And we're a life insurance company. We also provide asset management and long-term care insurance. Um, but, you know, our, our mission is relatively simple. We're here to provide financial security and peace of mind through our products and services. Uh, we are a mutual company, which means that we are uniquely aligned with our customers. Our customers essentially own the company. Um, and we've always, you know, led with integrity and humanity. There are core elements of our mission statement and values. And we're really here um, as the company you keep to be here long term for our customers. And and in your materials, you talk about helping your customers be good at life. Um, what does that mean beyond financial security? Can you drill down a little bit more? Yeah, well, I think, you know, related to sort of our, our product offering, it's this idea that life insurance is not just about, you know, receiving a check, your family receiving a check when you die. There are actually ways that you can use your whole life insurance policy to pay for college and to, you know, provide other opportunities throughout your life. But I think, you know, beyond that, it's this idea of, you know, what's your living legacy? So part of, you know, what a life insurance company allows you to do is preserve your financial legacy for, you know, the people you care about. But the reason why you do that is because you love people and and you care for people or things and um, you want to preserve that. And so I think, you know, Part of being good at life is thinking about um, how you're actually building that legacy while you're here with the people that you love. That's so well stated. And it's wonderful to hear about the mutuality of benefit between the company and the customer. Now, you have a lot of employees. You have over 10,000 employees, plus you have over 12,000 agents. And so um, as you begin to deepen your relationship with both of these core stakeholders. Um, how did you create alignment between what the foundation was doing and their passions? Yeah. So, you know, what I'd say is I've been here for just under five years, but the foundation has been around for nearly 40. And, you know, our first known sort of official contribution as a company dates back to 1853. So the idea of serving our communities and being there for the communities that we serve 
is really embedded in the history of the company. And, you know, the work that we do, especially through our agents on the ground, you know, really is a social good. So there's no need to explain to folks who work here how to embed social purpose into what we do, because what we do is an actual social purpose. You know, we, we provide real value um, for folks and security for people just through the products that we offer. But I think, you know, beyond that, there's, a, there's an old saying that, you know, life insurance is sold, not bought. You know, it's, it's a subject that people don't like to talk about. People don't like to think about their own mortality. And so the folks on the ground, you know, our, our distribution network really have to find ways to engage with the public to not just make them aware of, you know, what life insurance is and why people need it, but to build trusting relationships because this is, you know, a large purchase that you're going to make. You're likely only going to do it once, maybe twice in your life. Um, and so people really need to feel comfortable with the, with the company and the people behind that product. And so our folks have always then been engaged with their communities. You know, they've been out there just sort of looking for people to talk to, but also finding ways to build positive relationships in the communities that they serve. So there's no need at a company like New York Life to convince somebody about the need for a foundation or the need for community um, activism for, you know, social purpose, because it's really embedded in who we are. And if anything, I think our folks are looking for more ways to engage, looking for more programs, more support. And so, you know, for us, it's a balance of, you know, providing high quality programs and being able to do that across the entire country to serve the needs of our entire population. Share with our listeners how you got to the issue of child bereavement. Well, you know, again, it, it predates me, uh, so I can't take credit for it, but I wish I could because I just think it's such a an authentic uh, cause for a company like ours to undertake. But really, um, in some ways, it came to us. You know, we we um, heard from a group, uh, a bereavement camp came to us and sort of said, you know, this makes a lot of sense for a life insurance company. Why don't you find out more about the sector and find out more about us? And so we made a small grant about 10 years ago. Um, and right away, it just resonated with with the entire company. And so we really decided to learn more about the sector. And what we learned was that for as long as death has been with us, which is forever, <laughs> this um, particular sector is relatively nascent in terms of, you know, having sort of large membership organizations and a national presence. And it's not really an area that funders traditionally think of as a funding segment. And so, you know, we could quickly went beyond just funding direct service organizations into really raising awareness of the issue and of the field. And actually putting some some real money into research and looking at, you know, effective ways of sort of diagnosing, you know, who needs to have interventions, what are the most effective interventions, and really trying to, I think, professionalize the sector or work with the folks that were already working on that um, to, to sort of speed that up. And you say in your materials that one in 20 Americans... Uh, lose a parent or a sibling before they're 16. I'm actually very excited to give some new statistics because we actually did a research project this year that concluded this year with an organization called Judy's House in Denver, Colorado, and their JAG Research Institute. And what we found is that the incidence rate is actually higher. So one in 15 children will lose a parent or a sibling before the age of 18. And that's based on census data and other data sources that are publicly available. And so what we know is that that's probably a conservative number as well, because it doesn't really take into account real on the ground relationships where children aren't necessarily raised by their parents, but are raised by other figures or other family members. So that's the data that we have. And that tells us that at least one in 15 children will lose a parent before the age of 18. And I assume it's spread over all different years, all different geographies, zip codes and such. Yeah, and actually, so so the research, which is you know really interesting, and you can actually see it um, linked from our website, which is NewYorkLifeFoundation.org. It actually does it state by state. So, for example, you know the state with the highest incidence um, of childhood bereavement is West Virginia, um, mm. and so you can actually see how it varies state by state. Oh, fascinating! And bereavement would be a, losing a parent, a sibling, and you also talk about an important person. Yeah. Th so this data is is just parents and siblings, and it's losing them by death, which I think is an important distinction that we make. Um, there are many other 
ways that a parent and a loved one can be absent in somebody's life. And that's also a very important, you know, issue to deal with. But we we deal strictly uh, with the idea of death. And can you talk about the various program elements? I know that you have grief reach grants. And um, can you give, give our listeners the detail about that, how you, you know, because often a company will, eh, they'll give one or two grants or maybe some mini grants, but again, yours are very focused. Yeah. So we, um, so through the foundation itself, we do um, largely multi-year national focused or multi-state focused grants. And we have a lot of really interesting partners in this space. Um, one of our uh, largest grantees is the Center for School Crisis and Bereavement at the University of Southern California. And that project that we're working, we've been working on with them for nearly five years now is uh, the Coalition to Support Grieving Students, which is a project that has enlisted organizations throughout the K-12 through landscape. So the AFT, the NEA, school psychologists, school social workers, to provide a web-based resource to schools for them to become what we what we call more grief sensitive. Um, and through that, we've actually started a program internally called the Grief Sensitive Schools Initiative, where we send our own agents and employees to their local schools to provide a 15 to 20 minute synopsis of the resource, and then provide a small grant to that school to become more grief sensitive. And our goal is that every single school, public, private, K through 12 across the country, will start to embed, you know, this, this issue into how they prepare um, not just for disaster situations, but for everyday grief. So when a child loses a parent to cancer, um, and even, you know, years after a child has lost a parent, these, these things don't go away and they affect children at different times of their lives, you know, when different, different things happen. So a child going to middle school for the first time, a child having their first father daughter dance when they don't have a father, you know, all these things are things that schools need to consider. That, that, that's heart, that's heartbreaking just, just to think about that dance. Um, in terms of grief reach, um, you have donated to more than 230 organizations over the last eight years for over, I read on your websites, over $7 million to the, in these grants. Yeah. And that's actually about to, to go up because we're, we'll be announcing the next round of grief, grief reach winners soon. Um, but yeah, so, so, you know, because we're, we're relatively, we're a good sized, you know, corporate foundation, but we have one, you know, super fantastic bereavement grant maker, Maria Collins here. And she can possibly, you know, look at applications from hundreds and hundreds of small bereavement organizations. So what we've done in both our bereavement and our education portfolio is that we have um, worked with third party organizations who are experts in the field to help us run these local RFP programs. And so the National Alliance for Grieving, um, for Grieving Children, uh, NAGC, runs the Grief Reach program on our behalf. And every year they pick a slate of bereavement experts to go through these applications. And then they send us recommendations for finalists. And it allows us to make sure that, you know, the local groups that are doing the work on the ground are getting the funding and the support that they need. And in addition to just the grant dollars that they get, we also provide capacity building and other support for them to help them build their organization so that it can be more sustainable. That's really smart. Um, let's take a step back and talk about when you identified this issue, um, what was the sell-in process? Who did you have to convince? Um, did it take a long time? What did you do? Yeah. And again, you know, this predates me. It happened about 10 years ago, but you know, I think that the process was relatively simple to sort of get the first grant out the door. And I think, you know, my understanding is that once we worked with this bereavement camp, we had a few folks volunteer. Um, it was, it was sort of automatic. I mean, people really understood the connection and they understood not only, frankly, that this was just an area that makes a lot of sense for a life insurance company to invest in, but it was also a really unique opportunity to be at sort of the leading edge of developing an entire sector. I mean, it isn't often when you get an opportunity to help really seed and grow a field. Um, you know, we work in education as our other focus area, which is obviously a very established, you know, sector to invest in. And while you try to maybe carve out small pockets that um, you can focus on, you know, bereavement as a whole is really a sector that um, we have had, you know, an outsized role in the last decade. And I think that's been exciting for us. We're now working on finding other folks to come along with us on that funding and, you know, advocacy journey. 
But it really is, you know, it sets us apart. There's no other, there's no other insurance company, but I don't even think there's any other, you know, company out there that has um, a focus on childhood bereavement, much less the, the kind of focus that we have where we've invested over $40 million over the last decade. And, c- and congratulations for doing that. When you find, that's what we call it an open position. Um, and it's, and this one was a little bit, it's not as happy as, as companies want to do, you know, they want to be involved with animals and pet shelters and finding cures for diseases or, you know, walking for breast cancer as such. How do you deal with the grittiness of this and the sadness of this issue? Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And I think, you know, when I look at it, I, I guess I have, you know, a slightly different perspective because I think about it a lot. But, you know, the first thing is certainly this is something we deal with every day as a life insurance company. You know, every day we are contemplating and thinking about what happens when someone dies and we are encouraging people to think and make plans ahead of time. And it's much the same here. You know, a lot of our work is around what are the proactive steps that people can take to build resiliency in children, to build supports in systems like schools, so that these children are able to have what we would consider to be an adaptive response to grief. And while we know that the number is very high, one in 15 before the age of 18, the vast majority of children will lose somebody before they leave high school. It could be a neighbor, it could be a friend's parent. So we're all confronted with this. I think it's it's not so much that this is, you know, something to be avoided or something that's very negative. It's it's something that just happens and something that we have to confront. And I think there are ways of looking at it um, where you can you can see that there are are not happy but sort of positive outcomes here. You know, we've done studies of adults who suffered a loss as children, and when given proper you know proper support and interventions. Um, they, they have shown that they're more resilient as, re- as adults and that they confront these issues more head on. They plan better. You know, they, they talk about these things with their own children and families. And we've also done a, a project called the Shared Grief Project where, um, we interviewed celebrities and athletes, um, who lost a parent as a child and who, you know, I- to a certain extent took that experience and used that as motivation, um, to really, you know, push themselves and, and sort of, you know, get through that adversity in a positive way. And so I think we always look for opportunities to show that this is not something that is all tears and sadness. You know, at the end of this, we all get through this, you know, you have to get through these experiences and you can do it in a way that ends up being positive and adaptive, or you can do nothing, which can sometimes result in a negative impact. So this must accrue in a, in a tremendous way to your brand and your business but it's also a very sensitive area. So how do you integrate your progress, um, your milestones into your communications for New York Life? And especially, do you also take it, you've got obviously various stakeholders, you've got employees, agents, as well as policy owners. So how do you or don't you knit it into communications and engagement with those stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're right that it is a sensitive topic and we never want to be seen as taking advantage, you know, a, of a tragedy or, or something bad happening to just promote the programs that we offer. But we have, you know, had some success in integrating it sort of naturally through the business. So one example is in our claims kit. So, you know, wherever possible, our agents hand deliver um, claims. So they, they will hand deliver a check to a family in crisis. And what we've done is within our claims kit, if there are young children or, you know, family members under the age of 18 that are known, we actually have a pamphlet that we include in that claims kit. So in addition to getting the check and information about, you know, sort of the legal legalities of what has to happen, they also get information about how to speak to children about death. We also provide um, a state by state listing of bereavement resources in their area. And we offer a training for our agents so that they're prepared to speak to some of these issues and know what to say and what not to say when they're dealing with people who are um, in crisis. And I think, you know, we, we've sort of taken somewhat of a backseat approach. You know, we, we're not going to reach out to folks after a tragedy ha- happens and try to take advantage. But what we found is because we have such a deep, deep um, network and we're so deeply rooted in the sector, we find that people come to us. So, you know, one example was after the Parkland tragedy, Um, we have done a lot of work with Newtown. And so we have a good relationship with the Newtown Resiliency Center. 
And some of the folks down in Parkland reached out to the Newtown Resiliency Center and said, you know, what do we do when all these kids come back to school? How do we help them? What do we provide their parents? And they said, you should call New York Life and get a copy of their, you know, some of their resources. And so we were able to send them about 10,000 um, booklets called After a Loved One Dies, How Children Grieve and How Adults Can Support Them. And they were able to hand those out um, on the first day back for, you know, parents and children to be able to have that conversation at home. And so I think, you know, part of our, our strategy, if you can call it that, is just to be a known, credible resource um, and to be there like we are with our products when, you know, these organizations need us. Have you ever had a situation? I mean, obviously that work shows the power of a long-term commitment um, working in a, on an issue that is you're the first in um, doing it with great sensitivity. Has there ever, ever been a situation where an enthusiastic, um, you know, colleague wanted to do this incredible ad for the Super Bowl or, you know, maybe push it beyond where you would want to go? Um, no, I mean, I think we're, we're pretty um, in sync here. So, you know, we talk regularly with our marketing colleagues, with our communications colleagues. So it's unlikely something would happen like that without us being engaged and asking our opinion. Um, so no, I can, you know, I can't think of a, a time when that has happened. But, um, you know, there are other ways that we work to sort of get the message out. You know, one, I would say is through um, our political involvement network, which is, you know, a group of our, our field staff and agents that, um, you know, have relationships with local legislators and Congress people. And we actually give them and arm them with information about what we're doing from the foundation and some of our bereavement materials. Because they're often, you know, in a better position to share these resources when, let's say, a local tragedy occurs in their community. Um, they can reach out to their local, you know, legislator. They can reach out to their lo local church, their local community, and say, you know, we have these resources if you need them. Um, just know that they're there for you. And how does your CEO um, integrate this into his whether it's policy appearances, whether it's speeches, um, how does, does he liberally engage with it or just periodically? I'm sure he's very supportive. Yeah. So our, our CEO, Ted Mathis is actually the chair of our foundation board. So he is, um, he knows every single grant that we do. He's familiar with, you know, all of our partners and, um, is very, very keen on helping support this field. And I think, you know, he does a variety of, um, of things to keep this engaged. You know, I think the most important thing he does is serve as a champion for these issues internally. And, you know, again, I mentioned before that there's, there's never a need to convince anybody here that this is a, a good investment to make in a foundation and community work. But I think Ted's leadership, um, you know, being the, being the chair of the foundation and talking about these issues, um, you know, his pictures on our foundation website, um, he, he will be introducing our employee training for the grief sensitive schools program next month. Um, so I think the fact that he shows up and is very public in his support of these programs encourages other people to become involved. And that, that's best practice for sure. So you're very, very fortunate. The, the alignment across New York life is just, it's very, very powerful. Do you have a cross-functional team that meets that you may meet with periodically, not only to in, you know, update them on progress, but also to talk about ways to continue to advance your commitment? We, I mean, I, we don't have a cross-functional team that meets on a monthly basis, but what we do is we meet with all of our internal stakeholders on a monthly basis. So we, we do have dedicated support from our communications team. I meet with, you know, the chief diversity officer. We meet with our office of government affairs team. We meet with our marketing team. Um, on, on a monthly basis and to make sure that everybody not only knows what we're doing, but knows that they can incorporate, you know, our materials. They can talk about what we're doing in their own town halls, in their own work. And we're always looking for input around the company, you know, from a diverse group of stakeholders to make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, and I think when you do that, you also just start to build internal champions. And so it's, it's less of a, less of an issue in getting the information out because you have other people who are constantly championing it for you. Car carrying your messages. Do you encourage your employees as appropriate again to utilize social media cha channels to talk about some of your work or to retell a, a story that's appropriate? Um, we do to a certain extent. I think that's something we're looking at expanding 
more, you know, for certainly from the employee base. But with our agents, we actually utilize a tool um, that, for social media where they can put we can put approved posts, and they're allowed to use their their approved social media um, channels to to post messages. And so, for example, in November we'll have you know Children's Grief Awareness Day. We'll put a, a host of approved messages on the Facebook channel on LinkedIn. And they're allowed to use any of those messages whenever they want throughout the month. And they do. And so we really encourage that. Um, in addition, we work with our brand social channel, and they're constantly posting messages and highlighting things that we're working on on our brand social channel. And then our agents and employees in the field can then forward and, and like and, you know, be active with, the, with that channel. That's really, really wise. Again, um, certainly, it, it's we've had so many tragedies, whether terrorist attacks or school shootings or community shootings. Um, and I know that you have responded um, to these. Can you share with our listeners what, what actions you took? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, after hurricanes and things of that nature, like most companies, we're there to provide immediate emergency assistance, whether it be through a local organization or the Red Cross, supporting volunteer work for our employees and agents. Um, we have tried to be somewhat strategic about longer term response. So, for example, after this spate of, um, you know, man made and natural disasters that we had at the end of 17 going into early 18, um, we decided that we were going to offer a, a, a request for proposals program around trauma and grief. So, you know, even if, if the grief wasn't stemming from actual death, there are all these secondary grief and trauma issues that children and families go through, you know, loss of property, loss of income, having to move physically from a community that they were really embedded in. And so we'll actually be announcing the winners of that um, RFP process in the beginning of September. And the idea was, um, we knew because of just the enormity of what had happened that we wanted to do some long term funding. But we really wanted to concentrate in an area that doesn't get a lot of attention, which is really related to trauma and helping people longer term deal with what is really like PTSD when you go through something like a Maria or a Harvey and you're directly affected. Um, you know, some other things that we did after the, um, the shooting in Vegas, where we unfortunately lost one of our own agents, um, we worked with the local community in Las Vegas and UNLV to host a community event with some of our bereavement experts to help the community learn how to speak to this about children and how to talk about violence um, and death with children, and also to remind people about the importance of self-care. I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, towards the end of last year, even though I wasn't physically located in any of these places, I was just emotionally you know, sort of beat. And I think a lot of our folks were feeling that way too. There was just a, a general large drag, I think, on the country um, because of the back-to-back-to-back, -to -back -to -back, you know, horrific events we were seeing. And so I think it's important and part of the work that we do through the bereavement channel is making sure that those providers um, who are providing these services don't get, you know, totally worn out, but that we also, you know, help ourselves um, and, and take care of ourselves emotionally. That's a that's a really key point. Um, can you give you know two or three or a few more, um, you know, suggestions to our listeners about the power of focus in the long term, or you know, how do you take on an issue that might not be the happiest issue? Sure. I, I mean, you know, I think it really depends company to company on, on what your focus is. You know, we have the luxury of being a mutual company that is a long-term company. You know, our, our products are 30, 40, 50 year commitments that we're making. And so it's really in our blood to be thinking long-term and strategically about where we're going to be 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, but I think, you know, for me, just personally, I, I think the thing that resonates me when companies take on focus areas is that it just be authentic to the core um, sort of product or service of the business itself. Um, and if it can't be core to the actual product, it has to at least be authentic to the people that are at that company. And I don't think you really achieve real buy-in and long-term support for something unless the, the actual people that make up that company can really relate to that cause. And for us, you know, bereavement was just so closely aligned with the work that we're doing, with the social good that we're providing as a company. Um, 
that you don't really have to explain to folks why we would be putting time and, and resources into that. And beyond that, I think there's a real, you know, sort of selfish purpose in supporting something like that, you know, in that we are training our agents to be um, better at supporting families that need this help so that, you know, we can concentrate a bit more on the peace of mind part of our mission. You know, we're already doing the financial security, but if in addition to delivering a check and I'm an agent and I can actually deliver, you know, a resource and say there's a group in your community where your kids can go and get counseling and it's free and New York Life is providing support there, you know, that really just helps, I think, encircle what we're doing and what we're trying to provide um, at the core of who we are. And, and you're, fo- you're, you're touching on something that's so important today, which is empathy. And in the crazy world we live in and the pace that we're on, um, to be able to, to your point, to authentically share that, um, support it with your employees and your agents as well. You know, it really helps for them to have a relationship with their customers, not just a transaction. So it's very, very powerful. Yeah. And I think tactically, you know, some ways that you are able to have long term impact is by involving, you know, some of the senior executives of your company with these organizations. So when you have a senior executive who's committed three years to a board term, for example, it's unlikely that anybody's going to be cutting funding for that sector or that organization anytime soon. Um, but beyond that, I think it's also serving to educate those folks about the issue that, that the company is caring about. So they see it from a different, a different, you know, perspective. It's not just the head of the foundation offering a report or a progress report on paper. They're actually living that experience and understanding the mission, you know, the, the financials, you know, the, the sort of realities of running a nonprofit, which I think is very hard to explain in words if you're not embedded in understanding how an organization runs. And that's really wise. We sometimes refer to that as a walkabout, that if you can get your senior executives to put themselves, again, looking at empathy in the shoes of the NGO, uh, the recipient of the service, so they really can feel it. Um, I think that that's, you know, a tremendous way to, to create those champions and to, to get the engagement. Um, before we close, I would love for you to share a story or two where you've really been touched by this work. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's probably a million stories. I mean, it's hard to do anything in this field and not be touched. Um, you know, most recently, we, we just made a grant earlier this year with StoryCorps, um, which you might be familiar with. It's love story. Yeah, yeah. It's an organization that really helps folks, you know, talk to each other and preserve memories and stories um, for the long term. About 99% of what they do is archived in the Library of Congress. And, you know, we love the concept. We've been talking to them and we thought, you know, this has so many really positive implications for the childhood bereavement field. And so we've, we've done a three year grant with them and they started this earlier this year going to three different bereavement organizations, bringing their equipment, training folks on the kinds of conversations that they can be guiding and then recording, um, some of the children and their families, um, talking about the loved one who had passed and, so we listened to the first three uh, recordings that they sent us. And I have to tell you that um, they were all powerful, but there was just one, um, a woman, a, just probably a, a teenager and her father talking about the death of her mother. And, you know, at one point they start talking about, he says, you know, the thing that broke his heart was like listening to her cry in her room at night, you know, after, after her mother died. And then she in turn says, well, what broke my heart was seeing you in the hospital crying, you know, when mom died. And it's just this interplay of not only remembering the person, but having them share these intimate, um, you know, memories and feelings. And you can just hear them getting closer to each other during that conversation. And I feel like, you know, if you can, if you can have that much impact on just one family in a five minute conversation, you know, it really just validates the work that we're trying to do across the country, you know, with with really as many children as we possibly can interact with to make sure they have that adaptive response. That's, that's a wonderful story. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, I would love to just ask 
uh, on one other question, because you have um, multi-year relationships with many of your grantees. And I, I, I wrote a book called Breakthrough Not-for-Profit Branding to truly help the not-for-profit world be a better partner. Uh, can you share with our listeners, again, some, um, some insights, how to um, select a good grantee, but then how to maintain the relationship so it's a win-win and you truly um, can uh, create value for both sides? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the Bruven field has been a really interesting field to, to sort of embark on that kind of work because um, a lot of these local groups especially are started by people who have experienced a loss themselves turned around and didn't see any resources in their community and so started an organization to do that. And there are a lot of pros to that because the passion is there, the mission is there. But on the downside, you know, sometimes the the capacity and sort of the acumen needed to um to really, you know, run these organizations and think long term is lacking. And so I think on our end, you know, one of the biggest benefits we've been able to provide to our bereavement partners is a series of capacity building and, um, you know, really just sort of supportive <clears throat> measures to help them think about how they're going to exist and sustain as long-term organizations. Um, so we've done work on coming up with standards of care for the industry. We hold sessions with a partner CRE every year at the NAGC conference for all of our grantees that helps them, um, you know, figure out how to put together a strong board, how to work on their fundraising changes in tax law. So I think providing, if you can, as a funder, some of those just foundational supports for your partners can be hugely helpful. You know, I mean, we, you know, we talk a lot about skills based and, and doing that. And that's great. But I think just for some of our organizations, it's the basics, it's the foundational skill sets that need to be developed that a lot of these organizations don't have funding for. Um, so I think that's huge. And then I think, you know, what makes a good partner for us, frankly, our partners that are um, honest and open and proactive and communicating. So, you know, there are going to be problems and there are going to be bumps. And I think everyone can agree we'd rather know about it up front than find out about it when you're up for, you know, funding again. Um, and then I think, you know, putting together realistic timelines and realistic goals. Um, no one, no funder wants to, you know, require a grantee to come up with a new program or do something that they weren't planning on doing. But I think a lot of nonprofits are too scared to say no or to push back, you know, when ideas come to the table. So I think you really do have to have an honest relationship where both parties have skin in the game and both parties feel that they can push back. Those are tremendous insights to share. Um, I want to thank you, Heather, for a, a wonderful and in-depth conversation um, Keith Weed, who is the global uh, chief marketing officer for Unilever, he said it's time that we stop marketing at people and that we matter to them. And I believe that the work that you're doing as president of the New York Life Foundation, the company's long-term commitment to child bereavement, your commitment to not just dollars, but employee engagement, agent engagement, um, you know, building champions across your organization and also expanding on this issue, you are certainly having a huge impact in terms of mattering to children and siblings and families and their extended families across the country. So we want to thank you so much. And um, for our listeners, if they'd like to get additional information, could you give them, um, where would they go? Sure. We have a lot of information on our website, NewYorkLifeFoundation.org. Um, all of our bereavement resources are listed there and links out to a number of other really high quality organizations. And so thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that you've helped to um, educate and create greater um, understanding with our listeners today. And uh, I'm sure we all agree the reason you won this CECP award was because of your, your candor, your empathy, and your vision to truly make an authentic difference in the lives and so many of so many people around the country. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn, and I'd love to end, to end with this question. What do you stand for? Thank you very much.